those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. I am by no means a fan of Britney Spears' music. However, she is by far a more genuine human being than her parents. I'm wondering, uh, did Justin see the movie already? And what did he think of it? Yes, he saw it and he liked it. And was he a bit jealous huh? seeing you kissing with another boy? Um, no, it's just a movie. It's pretend. You're an adult, you should know that. It's Britney, bitch. I'm just going to make a brief statement. As most of you, I think, know, Judge Penny today, after a hearing, decided to agree with Britney Spears, and as of today, effective immediately, the conservatorship has been terminated as to both the person and the estate. This is a monumental day for Britney Spears. It's also a somber day for me, for Britney, and I think for a lot of us, who have been following conservatorships and how they operate. This conservatorship was corrupted by James P. Spears. Okay, rewind. To understand how he corrupted the conservatorship, we need to go right back to the start. In part two, we learned that by claiming Britney had dementia, Jamie was able to secure a permanent conservatorship. And that's where the corruption started. To wrap our heads around how that happened, we're going to tune in to my favourite little Aspie, that surprise witness, to read through the court documents that the doctor submitted regarding dementia. So we have here, I'm going to just zoom in a little bit. As you can see at the top, it was filed on September 22nd. Um, so a few days ago, but it just hit the docket yesterday. Um, so we have this guy, um, what's his name? David Stevenson, who is a medical doctor. He also has a master's in science and he's working on his PhD. Um, he is a healthcare consultant at EM Power Health in New York. So I've never heard of him before. And I think it's just like, he's just submitting a declaration. He's saying, this is a supplement to the petition to terminate the conservatorship of the person and the estate. So he is, as a doctor, writing in to help um, sort of give more reasons to terminate the conservatorship. So number uh, paragraph one, he says, David Stevenson, who calls himself Dr. Dave, is a trained, but honestly, thanks. Calling yourself Dr. Dave makes it a lot easier because like all the Mr. and last names is very confusing. Um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Dave is a trained medical doctor with 15 years of clinical experience. So he's already a trained, he's already a doctor. He's going back for his PhD right now. He has subject matter expertise in the medical and legal aspects of the instant case. So the medical and legal aspects of Brittany's case, he's saying he is an expert on that. He rely, oh, sorry. Uh, and he wishes to provide further perspective from a different vantage point as the author of this petition dr dave relies on the uh, uh, sorry inherent power of this court to excuse his non-legalese style of writing in favor of using oh, okay so he's asking the court to forgive him of using non-legalese in favor of using creative elements and a tongue-in-cheek mannerism or tongue-in-cheek mannerisms at times this is a little, this might be why um, Emily D. Baker was like, this filing is a little messy. The facts should not take away from the facts and expert opinions he is offering. So he's basically saying, look, I'm not a lawyer. What I'm about to say is I'm an expert in though. So I might not be a writing expert, but I am certainly an expert uh, in this stuff. So don't take, don't take, you know, cause I don't have all my comments and periods in the right spot as taken away from my experience because I am an expert. So that's basically what he's saying. And I agree. So paragraph two, he says, there is insufficient evidence. So he's saying there's not enough evidence that Brittany needs a probate conservatorship. 
And it was an abuse of discretion by Judge Reva Gates when the initial order for the temporary conservatorship was placed. Without probing the motives of those individuals initiating the conservatorship, without checking the credentials of the declarant physician doing the capacity declaration, or he calls it a capacity evaluation, and by appointing Mr. Ingham as Brittany's lawyer over her personal choice of Mr. Streisand. I'm Adam Streisand. I am a trial lawyer, and my practice is focused on conservatorships and battles over estates. I got a call from uh, Brittany's family law attorneys and asked me if I would speak to Brittany because, well, the whole world knew that her father was trying to establish a conservatorship over her. Hey, she's trying to get out. Please don't shoot me, Wait, 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 wait. Come on, Brittany. Let her go. Let her go through, please. Give her some room to go through. Get her Let's some room. I met with Brittany. Hey, hey, be careful. You're hurting her. Back off. We agreed to meet at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Well, that's pretty famous because there was a lot of paparazzi. And the first question I had was, does Brittany have the capacity to be able to hire me? Does she have the ability to take my advice. So the first thing is, Brittany was able to make the judgment, hey, I get what's going on. I get that I'm not gonna be able to resist this conservatorship or avoid this conservatorship, right? So that's a pretty sound judgment. The second thing was, she said, I don't want my father to be the conservator. That was her one request. She wanted a professional, somebody independent. And was she opposed to her dad as the conservator of the estate, the person, or both? Both. Brittany did not want her father to be the conservator of her person, right? The person who makes decisions about her medical care and treatment and so on and so forth. She also didn't want him controlling her finances. The day that I went to court for her, the judge said, um, I've got a medical report and you haven't seen it, Mr. Streisand, and I'm not gonna show it to you. And it shows that she's not capable of retaining counsel and directing counsel on her own. When the judge told me, Mr. Streisand, I'm not gonna let you represent her, I'm gonna appoint somebody. I felt that was not the right decision by the judge. I felt that based on my interactions with Brittany, that she was capable of retaining me and directing me and that the judge should have allowed that to happen. Can you give us some kind of a heads up on what happened here today? No, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna, gonna be giving any statements on But. I didn't know what I didn't know, right? I still don't know what is in that report. And so I had to respect that. The last point has been argued in other petitions and nothing further will be addressed here on that point. So then he says, number three, the physician Dr. James Edward Sparr went outside of his area of expertise when making the declaration that extended the conservatorship. Dr. Sparr is a geriatrician, geriatrician. He's like an old people doctor. And his practice is limited to the care of the elderly who are the population affected by severe neurodegenerative conditions like dementia. He is an author of journal articles related to the evaluation of mental capacity of individuals involved in probate court matters, but is solely based on experience of geriatric clients. Okay. For the proponents of this conservatorship, so for Team Con, there's no apparent appreciation for the self-evident fact that Brittany is a highly functional, productive artist which belies any claim that she does not have the capacity to make decision for herself. So he's saying like, okay, Team Con wants to keep like ignoring the fact that Brittany is obviously able to make decisions for herself. So the fact alone that she's doing all this work means that, you know, this is a felt self-evident and y'all are just ignoring it. Brittany's a superstar. She's a singer. She dances, she acts, and she does all of entertainment. And I love that she really is such a fan of music and was a little bit surprised. But it's so easy for us to think that talent can be manufactured. It's so easy for us to think that there's some adult saying, do this, do that, sing this, walk like, do this. And, and the truth is, Britney really is an artiste. So he's like, according to an authority, 
I don't know who the authority is on the probate code, the eligibility criteria is, you know, the following. The inability to properly provide for basic needs such as physical health, food, clothing, and shelter. And where the subject is substantially unable to manage financial affairs and to resist fraud or undue influence. Further, uh, the subject that's like the proposed conservatee is generally someone suffering from a major neurodegenerative disorder such as dementia. Okay, so he's basically saying, who's filed this? This is just some random doctor in New York. Um, generally, in the young, severe mental conditions like dementia that would be appropriate for a probate conservatorship are rare and caused by genetic factors or metabolic diseases that would require extensive workup. There are no reports of Brittany having any neurodegenerative conditions in her family history. If that were the case, it would have been most likely reported like every other aspect of her life. If she has a metabolic disease, there are millions of people who would like to have the same as her health, energy, level, and vitality have never been an issue other than those times when she was heavily sedated with psychotropics. In addition, it seems doubtful that Dr. Spar has any appreciation for the fact that young minds like Brittany's are responsive to behavioral and lifestyle changes alone. A condition called neuroplasticity that is a well-known phenomenon in the neurological sciences. He's basically saying like, if Dr. Spar actually knew about young people, like Brittany was only 26 at the time of this diagnosis, he would have been able to know that there's other reasons, excuse me, that could have explained her behaviors that were not dementia, but because this guy just specializes, Dr. Spard specializes in like, you know, the elderly and aging population. For that reason, we don't actually know um, if she has dementia. We don't actually know if this was, he was even qualified. Like you need a real specialist seems to be what um, Dr. Dave here is implying. So basically so far he has said, Dr. Dave has said, listen, I'm an expert. I'm not going to be talking in legalese, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, there's no evidence that Brittany needs to be in this conservatorship. Judge Reva Gates didn't do what she was supposed to do. Then they have this doctor over here whose specialty is old people, has nothing to do with young people. So we don't even really know if Brittany got an appropriate diagnosis at all, on top of the fact that none of this stuff was even filed appropriately. But he's just saying, like, it's unlikely she has dementia. So then paragraph six. Regarding the ability for Brittany to provide basic needs such as physical health, food, clothing, and shelter, she is the embodiment of physical health. She hires people to prepare food for her, and when they are not available, she knows how to drive her Mercedes through the fast food lane. Her clothes shopping is legendary and can be ver verified by Versace, Louis Vuitton, and other Rodeo Drive merchants, and she owns her own mansion. This part of the probate code can be put to rest. Oh, I see what he's saying. So he's saying, look, Brittany maybe isn't the person who's cleaning her own house or cooking her own food, but she is able to provide for herself, which is the code. It isn't, are you able to cook your own food? It's, are you able to provide for your own self, right? And he's saying, look, I don't even care if Brittany is hiring someone. To, so what? If she, if nobody's there, she knows how to go to the drive through Maybe that's not the healthiest choice. But everybody who makes that choice when they make it has the freedom and liberty to make it. So he's saying like she can clearly provide for herself. So we don't have to actually even ask ourselves whether or not she can provide for herself. Look, she can. She does is what he's saying. Number seven, the undue influence portion of the probate code is more complicated from a medical legal standpoint. I never saw that word hyphenated like that. Medico legal. So he's saying there's another there's another test here and it's this undue influence. So he's 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 tackling the code as a lawyer would. First part of the code. Is she substantially unable to provide for herself? Well, he's saying no. Clearly she has a mansion, a Mercedes. She has all these things that she's provided for herself. She gets in the car and goes to eat when she wants to. She hires people to cook her food, so she's clearly providing for herself. So he's like, "Fine. That moving to the side." Next, there's this part of the code that says there's undue influence that has to be taken into consideration. So he's saying now that portion of the code is more complicated from a medical legal standpoint. Um, from Dr. Spar's most recent, sorry, uh, published articles, 
related to practitioners making capacity declarations. <laughs> so he's citing Dr. Spar's own articles against him. Uh, so this is what Dr. Spar said in his most recent article, that when the issue is undue influence, he does not believe the treating physician should be the one making the judgment because they may be influenced too much by family members. Oh my God, what a good finding. Instead, it should be left to an independent evaluator like, like Dr. Spar. Wait, so Dr. Spar has said he doesn't believe the treating physician should be the one making the judgment. So do y'all remember when Britney Spears, like she already had her own doctor back in 2008 and Gerald Dean tried to get that doctor to declare Britney or to do the capacity declaration for Britney. And that doctor said his lawyer told him he doesn't, he doesn't want to do that. His lawyer told him not to do that declaration. So in this filing we're looking at here, Dr. Dave is saying, okay, well, look, Dr. Spar Another thing about him, he writes all these articles. So let's look at one of these articles. He said he doesn't think that the patient's actual doctor should be the one making the decision because the family can influence them. So instead, it should be left to independent evaluators like Dr. Spar. So he's kind of, that's kind of like a making people come pick him type of thing, right? Um, so Dr. Dave here says, um, the stance is a new one for Dr. Spar, uh, being promoted by him and is opposed by the IPA task force. Recommendations in both the American Bar and American Psychological Associations, right? So we have all these recommendations from all these associations, task force, task forces, etc. And Dr. Spar is going right against them and saying, no, he disagrees with them. He, he's saying he should be the one making these evaluations, not the treating physician who actually knows the patient. Now, listen, if I'm going to be put in a conservatorship, I absolutely want my doctor who I was able to choose years ago and who I've worked with, who's seen me through all kinds of life struggles and things. I want that doctor who knows me to be the one making the evaluation. Now, that's my, my choice. Maybe not everybody knows and trusts their doctor, but... From my perspective, it makes more sense that the doctor who actually knows this patient would be the one making the report, not just some random like James Farr who just showed up out of nowhere. And it would seem that the American Psychological Association and the American Bar Association agree. So then Dr. Dave says, a common sense approach to making decisions about undue influence would require an evaluation of whether the influencer, usually family members, has an agenda. The jury is still out on whether the treating provider is the one to make that call or whether someone like Dr. Spar. What if Dr. Spar, however, is the one with the agenda? What if he proposes, what he proposes would certainly concentrate the decision-making power in too few hands and could certainly lead to corruption. Exactly. And this is all common sense. And I love that he highlighted that he used the word common sense because we have to get back to that. In the courts, people have completely abandoned common sense. It's like, oh, well, the rule's this and the rule's that and there must be a reason. No, baby, this is corruption and criminals. Like, no. If it doesn't make common sense to you, chances are somebody is profiting or benefiting in some way that's improper. So he's saying we should look into these things about whether people have agendas. But what about if Dr. Spar has an agenda? His, his word alone is going to take all the power, constitutional rights and everything that Brittany has lost away from her and give it to someone else. So what about that? Y'all just not gonna figure that in? And also something else that he hasn't mentioned here yet is, Dr. Spar has appeared on panels with Reva Gates. So they're friendly. Reva Gates, Sam Ingham, and Dr. Spar have appeared at Beverly Hills Bar Association's events together on panels speaking together about the same topics. So they all know each other. They're probably friends. So he's saying what Dr. Spar proposes would certainly concentrate the decision-making power in too few hands and could certainly lead to corruption. Possibly, Dr. Spar is suggesting that only those qualified to make these decisions would be highly degreed practitioners of both law and medicine that you would only find at academic centers, which are places constantly looking for more funding. Okay. And he, Okay, so what he's saying is there's only a few people who can really do this. If what James Barr is saying is correct, then there's only really a few people 
who can even make these evaluations. And those people would be working in situations where they would be um, susceptible to financially financial manipulation or being influenced with someone else's money because maybe they would be looking for funding. In his academic writing, Dr. Spar seems to be promoting his own agenda with his unsupported stance around the role of a non-treating practitioner versus an independent evaluator such as himself. So in his academic writing, Dr. Spar is creating this dichotomy where it's like, no, you can't trust your actual doctor, the one who's already treating you. You, you know, but you can trust me. I'm an independent evaluator. Like, see my link below or whatever, right? Then Dr. Dave says, maybe Dr. Spar is right, or maybe he will be using this self-appointed power to have leverage where there are large fortunes at stake and too many others willing to cut shady deals. Oh, Dr. Dave, you better tell them. Who knows? Anytime there is concentrated, unbalanced power, this kind of thing is possible. Who knows? This is exactly right. Who knows? There's no harm in having the author with his own medical legal knowledge to point this out. It is important to get the kind of thing, sorry, excuse me. It is important to get this kind of thing right, given the potential for corruption and abuse. <laughs> Agreed. For instance, it is said that Brittany herself is reportedly missing up to $600 million that is unaccounted for. Uh, stops. Investigate Stonebridge. Okay. This is so funny. This kind of money provides a lot of motivation for abuses of power when the decision-making authorities are confined to a few individuals who are not accountable to anyone. Agreed. It's just common sense. Paragraph 8. <clears throat> In as far and as far as any proclivity to be unduly influenced by others to the point of being exploited, it is not supported by any known facts. Even though Brittany lived a life under the microscope, even though her spending sprees can be taken by some as excessive, when it is put in the light of her enormous wealth and prospects for continued earning with both music and product endorsements, Brittany has the reputation of everything she touches turning to gold. Not just music either, as she has endorsements for a perfume line that is said to be in the hundreds of millions, even billions of dollars in revenue. In a free society, it is not appropriate for anyone to impose their opinions as to what another individual spends the fruit of their own labor on. I'm going to say, you know, generally I agree. Like there's exceptions, of course, to everything. But like, I agree. Nobody should really be caring what Britney's spending her money on because it's hers. Ironically. Sorry, I was reading something. Ironically, the only evidence of exploitation Britney has. Sorry. The only evidence of exploitation to Britney has come about by those who benefit financially from the 13 and a half year conservatorship. This has been revealed in document uh, documentaries such as featured on Netflix by the New York Times. Oh, that wasn't Netflix. It was Hulu and FX, um, which has been viewed around the globe. There's also many media reports and much news on social media from witnesses to the abuses. Oh, that's not me. <laughs> Most notably is the testimony of Brittany herself, live in the courtroom on June 23rd. Basically, a lot has happened since two years ago, the last time I wrote all this down, um, the last time I was in court. I will be honest with you, I haven't been back to court in a long time because I don't think I was heard on any level when I came to court the last time. I brought four sheets of paper in my hands and wrote in length what I had been through the last four months before I came there. The people who did that to me should not be able to walk away so easily. I'll recap. I was on tour in 2018, I was forced to do. My management said, if I don't do this tour, I will have to oh, find an attorney. This is, this is, um, I, just, I hate to interrupt you, but my court reporter is taking down what you're saying. Okay. And so you have to speak a little more slowly. Oh, oh of course, yes. Okay, and, I apologize, great. Okay. Sure. Um, the people who did this to me should not get away and to be able to walk away so easily. Recap, I was on tour in 2018. I was forced to do. My management said if I don't do this tour, I will have to find an attorney and by contract, my own management could sue me if I didn't follow through with the tour. He handed me a sheet of paper as I got off the stage in Vegas and said I had to sign it. 
It was very threatening and scary. And with the conservatorship, I couldn't even get my own attorney. So out of fear, I went ahead and I did the tour. When I came off that tour, a new show in Las Vegas was supposed to take place. I started rehearsing early, but it was hard because I'd been doing Vegas for four years and I needed a break in between. But no, I was told this is the timeline and this is how it's gonna go. I rehearsed four to four days a week, um, half of the time in the studio and half of the other time in a Westlake studio. I was basically directing most of the show with my whereabouts where I preferred to rehearse and actually did most of the choreography, meaning I taught my dancers my new choreography myself. I take everything I do very seriously. There's tons of video with me at rehearsals. I wasn't good, I was great. I led a room of 16 new dancers in rehearsals. It's funny to hear my manager's side of the story. They all said I wasn't participating in rehearsals and I never agreed to take my medication, which my medication is only taken in the mornings, never at rehearsal. They don't even see me. So why are they even claiming that? When I said no to one dance move into rehearsals, um, it was as if I planted a huge bomb um, somewhere. And I, I said, no, I don't want to do it this way. After that, my management and my dancers and my assistant of the new people that were supposed to do the new show all went into a room, shut the door and didn't come out for at least 45 minutes. Ma'am, I'm not here to be anyone's slave. I can say no to a dance move. I was told by my at the time therapist, Dr. Benson, who died, that my manager called him in that moment and told him I wasn't cooperating or following the guidelines in rehearsals. And he also said I wasn't taking my medication, which is so dumb because I've had the same lady every morning for the past eight years give me my same medication and I'm nowhere near these stupid people. It made no sense at all. There was a week period where they, they were nice to me and they said, I don't want to do, and I told them I don't want to do the, um, they, wait, no, they were, they were nice to me. They said, if I don't want to do the new Vegas show, I don't have to, cause I was getting really nervous. I said, I can wait. It was like, they told me I could wait. It was like lifting literally 200 pounds off of me when they said I don't have to do in the show anymore. Cause it was, I was really, really hard on myself and it was too much. Um, I couldn't take it anymore. So I remember telling my assistant, but you know what? I feel weird if I say no, I feel like they're going to come back and be mean to me or punish me or something. Three days later, after I said no to Vegas, my therapist sat me down in a room and said he had a million phone calls about how I was not cooperating in rehearsals and I haven't been taking my medication. All of this was a false. He, uh, he immediately the next day put me on lithium out of nowhere. He took me off my normal meds I'd been on for five years. And lithium is a very, very strong um, and completely different medication compared to what I was used to. You can go mentally impaired if you take too much, if you stay on it longer than five months. But he put me on that and I felt drunk. I really couldn't even take up for myself. I couldn't even have a conversation with my mom or dad really about anything. I told them I was scared and I, my doctor had me on six different nurses with this new medication, come to my home, stay with me, to monitor to me on this new medication, which I never wanted to be on to begin with. There were six different nurse, nurses in my homes and they wouldn't let me get in my car to go anywhere. For, for a month. Not only did my family not do a goddamn thing, my dad was all for it. Anything that happened to me had to be approved by my dad. And my dad only, he acted like he didn't know that I was told I had to be tested over the Christmas holidays before they sent me away when my kids went to home to Louisiana. He was the one who approved all of it. My whole family did nothing. Over the two week holiday, a lady came into my home for four hours a day, sat me down and did a psych test on me. It took forever but i was i was told i had to then after that i got off oh, um wait i was told i had to then after i got a, a phone call from my dad saying after i did the psych test with this lady basically saying i had failed the test or whatever or whatever um i'm sorry Brittany. you have to listen to your doctors they are planning to send you to a small home in beverly hills to do a small rehab program that we're going to make up for you you're going to pay sixty thousand dollars a month for this I cried on the phone for an hour and he loved every minute of it. The control he had over someone as powerful as me, as he loved the control to hurt his own daughter 100,000%, he loved it. I packed my bags and went to that place. I worked seven days a week, no days off, which in California, the only similar thing to this is called sex trafficking, making anyone work, work against their will, taking all their possessions away, credit card, cash, phone, passport card, and placing them in a home where they they work with the people who live with them. They all, they all lived in the house with me, the nurses, the 24 seven security, 
um, there there was one chef that came there and cooked for me um, daily on the during the weekdays. They watched me change every day, naked, morning, noon, and night. Um, my body, I had no privacy door for my um, for my room. I gave eight gals of blood a week. If I didn't do any of my meetings and work from ten, um, eight to six at night, which is 10 hours a day, seven days a week, no days off, I wouldn't be able to see my kids or my boyfriend. I never had a say in my schedule. They always told me I had to do this. And ma'am, I will tell you, sitting in a chair 10 hours a day, seven days a week, it ain't fun. And especially when you can't walk out the front door. And that's why I'm telling you this again two years later. After I've lied and told the whole world I'm okay and I'm happy, it's a lie. I thought I just maybe I said that enough. Maybe I might become happy because I've been in denial. I've been in shock. I am traumatized. You know, fake it till you make it. But now I'm telling you the truth, okay? I'm not happy. I can't sleep. I'm so angry, it's insane. And I'm depressed. I cry every day. And the reason I'm telling you this is because I don't think how the state of California can have all this written in the court documents from the time I showed up and do absolutely nothing. Just hire with my money another person to keep and keep my dad on board. Ma'am, my dad and anyone involved in this conservatorship and my management who played a huge role in punishing at me when I said, no, ma'am, they should be in jail. Their cool tactics working for Miley Cyrus as she smokes on joints and stage at the VMAs. Nothing is ever done to this generation for doing wrong things. But my precious body who's worked for my dad for the past fucking 13 years, trying to be so good and pretty, so perfect when he works me so hard. When I do everything I'm told in the state of California allowed my fa ignorant father to take his own daughter who only has a role with me if I work with him. They set back the whole course and allowed him to do that to me. That's given these people I've worked for way too much control. They also threatened me and said, if I don't go, then I have to go to court. And it will be more embarrassing me if the judge publicly makes you go the, the evidence we have, you have to go. I was advised for my image, I need to go ahead and just go and get it over with. They said that to me, I don't, I don't even drink alcohol. I, sh I should drink alcohol considering what they put my heart through. Also the Bridges facility they sent me to, none of the kids, the, 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 I, went, I was doing this program for four months. So the last um, two months I went to a Bridges facility. None of the kids there did the, the, did the program. They never showed up for any of them. Um, you didn't have to do anything if you didn't want to. How come they always made me go? How come I was always threatened by my dad and anybody that participated in this conservatorship? If I don't do this, what they tell me to enslave me to do, they're gonna punish me. The last time I spoke to you by just keeping the conservatorship going and also keeping my dad in the loop made me feel like I was dead. Like I didn't matter. Like nothing had been done to, to me. Like you thought I was lying or something. I'm telling you again, because. I'm not lying. I want to feel heard. And I'm telling you this again, so maybe you can understand the depth and the degree and the damage that they did to me back then. I want changes and I want changes going forward. I deserve changes. I was told I have to sit down and be evaluated again if I want to end the conservatorship. Ma'am, I didn't know I could petition the conservatorship to end it. I'm sorry for my ignorance, but I honestly didn't know that. But honestly, but I don't think I owe anyone to be evaluated. I've done more than enough. I don't feel like I should even be in room with anyone to offend me by trying to question my capacity of intelligence, whether I need to be in this stupid conservatorship or not. I've done more than enough. I don't owe these people anything, especially me, the one that has roofed and fed tons of people on tour on the road. It's embarrassing and demoralizing what I've been through. And that's the main reason I've never said it openly. And mainly I didn't want to say it openly because I honestly don't think anyone would believe me. To be honest with you, the Paris Hilton story on what they did to her to that, that school, I didn't believe any of it, of it. I'm sorry, I'm an outsider and I'll just be honest, I didn't believe it. And maybe I'm wrong and that's why I didn't want to say any of this to anybody, to the public, because I thought people would make fun of me or laugh at me and say, she's lying, she's got everything, she's Britney Spears. I'm not lying. I just want my life back and it's been 13 years and it's enough. It's been a long time since I've owned my money and it's my wish and my dream for all of this to end without being tested. Again, it makes no sense whatsoever for the state of California to sit back and literally watch me with their own two eyes make a living for so many people and pay so many people trucks and buses on, tour on the road with me and be told I'm not good enough. 
but I'm great at what I do. And I allow these people to control what I do, ma'am, and it's enough. It makes no sense at all. Now, going forward, I'm not willing to meet or see anyone I've met with enough people against my will. I'm done. All I want is to own my money for this to end and my boyfriend um, to drive me in his fucking car. And I would honestly like to sue my family, to be totally honest with you. Um, I also would like to be able to short share my story with the world and um, what they did to me instead of it being a hush hush secret to benefit all of them. I wanna be able to be heard on what they did to me by making me keep this in for so long is not good for my heart. I've been so angry and I cry every day. It concerns me, I'm told I'm not allowed to expose the people who did this to me. For my sanity, I need you to the judge to approve me, do, be, do an interview where I can be heard on what they did to me. And actually, I have the right to use my voice and take up for myself. My attorney says I can't, um, it's not good. I can't let the public know anything they did to me and by not saying anything is saying it's okay. I, I don't know what I said here. It's not okay. I would much, actually, I don't want to interview. I'd much rather just have an open call to you for the press to hear, which I didn't know today we're doing. So thank you. Instead of having an interview, honestly, I need that to get it off my heart, the anger and all of it that, that um, that's, that's been happening. <clears throat> It's not fair they're telling me lies about me openly. Even my family, they do interviews to anyone they want on news stations, my own family doing interviews and talking about the situation and making me feel so stupid. And I can't say one thing. And my own people say I can't say, say anything. It's been two years. I want a recorded call to you. Actually, we're doing this now, which I didn't know that we were doing this. Um, to the public and say knows what they did to me. I told my, um, I know my lawyer, Sam, has been very scared for me to go forward because he's saying if I speak up, I'm being over overworked in that facility of that rehab place that the rehab place will sue me. He told me I should keep it to myself, really. I would personally like to actually I know I've, I've had grown with a personal relationship with Sam, my lawyer. I've been talking to him like three times um, a week now. We've kind of built a relationship, but I haven't really had the opportunity by my own self to actually handpick the, my own lawyer by myself. Um, and I would like to be able to do that. Um, I would like to um, also, um, the main reason why I'm here is because I want to end the conservatorship without having to be evaluated. I've done a lot of research, ma'am, and there's a lot of judges who do end conservatorships for people without them having to be evaluated all the time. The only times they don't is if a concerned family member says something's wrong with this person and consider um, and other, Otherwise, and considering my family has lived off my conservatorship for 13 years, I won't be surprised if one of them has has something to say and go forward and say, we don't think this should end. We have to help her, especially if I get my fair served in turning exposing what they did to me. Also, I want to speak to you about at the moment my obligations, which I personally don't think at the very moment I owe anybody anything. I have three meetings a week I have to attend no matter what. I just don't like feeling like I work for the people whom I pay. I don't like being told I have to no matter what, even if I'm sick. Jody, the conservator, says I um, I have to see my coach Ken even when I'm sick. I would like to do one meeting a week with a therapist. I've never in before, even before they sent me to that place, had two therapy sessions. Um, a therapy one a therapy session and one therapy session with um my I have a doctor and then a therapy person. Um, what I've been forced to do illegal in my life, I shouldn't be told I have to be available three times a week to these people I don't know. I'm talking to you today because I feel again, yes, even Jody is starting to kind of take it too far with me. They have me going to therapy twice a week and a psychiatrist. I've never in the past had, wait, they have me going, yeah, twice a week and I'm a Dr. Gold, so that's three. I've never in the past had to see a therapist more than once a week. It takes too much out of me going to this man I don't know. Number one, I'm scared of people. I don't trust people with what I've been through. And the clever setup of being in Westlake, one of the most exposed places in Westlake, which today, yesterday, paparazzi showed me coming out of the place, literally crying um, in therapy. It's embarrassing and it's demoralizing. I deserve privacy when I go. I deserve privacy when I go and have therapy either at my home, like I've done for eight years. They've always come to my home or um, when the Dr. Benson, the guy, the man that died, um, I went to a place similar to what I went to in Westlake, which was very exposed and really bad. Um, okay, so wait, where was I? In Westlake, it's, I, it was identical to Dr. Benson, but who died, the one who illegally, yes, 100% abused me by the treatment he gave me too. And to be totally honest with you, I was yeah, so- Excuse me for interrupting you. 
but my reporter says if you could just slow down a little bit because she's trying to make sure she gets everything that you're saying. Okay, cool. And so if you could, so okay. Um, I have been through, and the clever stuff in Westlake is identical to Dr. Benson, who died, the one who illegally, yes, 100% abused me by the treatment he gave me. And to be totally honest with you, when he passed away, I got on my knees and thank God. In other words, my team is pushing, with, pushing it with me again. I have trapped phobias being in small rooms because the trauma locking me up in, for four months in that place is not okay for them to send me, sorry, I'm going fast, to that small room like that. Twice a week with another new therapist, I pay that I never even approved. I don't like it. I don't want to do that. And I haven't done anything wrong to deserve this treatment. It's not okay to force me to do anything I don't want to do. By law, at, by law, Jody and this so-called team should honestly, I should be able to sue them for threatening me and saying, if I don't go and do these meetings twice a week, we, can, we can't let you have your money and go to Maui on your vacations. You have to do what you're told for this program and then you will be able to go. But it was very clever they picked one of the most exposed places in Westlake, knowing I have the hot topic of the conservatorship, that over five paparazzis are going to show up and get me crying coming out of that place. I begged them to make sure that they did this at my home so I would have privacy. I deserve privacy. The whole conservatorship from the beginning, once... um. The conservatorship, oh, the conservative conservatorship from the beginning. Once you see someone, whoever it is, in the conservatorship making money, making them money and myself money and working, that whole that whole statement right there, the conservatorship should end. There should be no, I shouldn't be in a conservatorship if I can work and provide money and work for myself and pay other people. It makes no sense. The laws need to change. What state allows people to own another person's money and account and threaten them and saying, you can't spend your money unless you do what we want you to do and I'm paying them. Ma'am, I've worked since I was 17 years old. You have to understand how thin that is for me. Every morning I get up to know I can't go on somewhere unless I meet people I don't know every week in an office identical to the one where the therapist was very abusive to me. I truly believe this conservatorship is abusive. And now we can sit here all day and say, oh, conservatorships are here to help people. But ma'am, there's a thousand conservatorships that are abusive as well. I don't feel like I can have live a full life. I don't owe... I don't owe them to go see a man I don't know and share him my problems. I don't even believe in therapy. I always think you take it to God. I want to end the conservatorship without being evaluated. In the meantime, I want this therapist um, once a week. He can either come to my home. Um, no, I just want him to come to my home. I'm not willing to go to Westlake and be embarrassed by all these paparazzi the scummy paparazzi laughing at my faces while I'm crying, coming out and taking my pictures as all these um, white, nice dinners where people are drinking wine at restaurants, watching me leave these places. They set me up by sending me to the most exposed places, places and I told them I didn't want to go there because I knew um, paparazzi would show up there. Um, uh, they only gave me two options for therapists, and I'm not sure how you make your decisions, ma'am, but this is the only chance for me to talk to you for a while. I need your, your help. So if you can just kind of let me know where your head is, I, I don't really honestly know what to say, but my requests are just to end the conservatorship without being evaluated. I, I want a petition basically to end the conservatorship, but I want to, I want it to be petitioned to end it, but I don't want to be evaluated and be sat in a room with people four hours a day like they did me before. And they made it even worse for me after that happened. So I just, I, I I, I'm honestly new at this and I'm doing research on all these things. I do know common sense and the method that things can end it for people. It has ended without them being evaluated. So I just want you to take that in considerate consideration. I've also done research. Um, um, wait, also took a year during COVID to get me any self care methods during COVID. She said there were no services available. She's lying, mom. Ma'am, my mom went to the spa twice in Louisiana during COVID. For a year, I didn't have my nails done, no hairstyling and no massages, no acupuncture, nothing for a year. I saw the maids in my home each week with their nails done different each time. She made me feel like my dad does, very similar, her behavior and my dad, but just a different dynamic. Team wants me to work and stay home instead of having longer vacations. They're, they you, they are used to me sort of doing a weekly routine for them and I'm over it. I don't feel like I owe them anything at this point. 
they need to be reminded they actually work for me. They trick me by sending me to the most, okay, I repeated myself there. Um, okay. Uh, um, also, I was supposed to be able to, um, I have a friend that I used to do AA meetings with. I did AA for two years. I have like, you know, um, I did three meetings a week. You know, I met a bunch of um, women there and I'm not able to see my friends that le live eight minutes away from me, which I find extremely strange. Um, I, I feel like they're making me feel like I live in a rehab program. This is my home. Um, I'd like for my boyfriend to be able to drive me in his car. Um, and I want to meet with a therapist once a week, not twice a week. And I want him to come to my home because I actually know I do need a little therapy. <laughs> Um, I was told, um, um, hold on. I think that's, oh, and I would like to progressively move forward and I want to have the real deal. I want to be able to get married and have a baby. I was told right now in the conservatorship, I'm not able to get married or have a baby. I have a, um, ID inside of myself right now. So I don't get pregnant. I wanted to take the ID out so I could start trying to have another baby, but this so-called team won't let me go to the doctor to take it out because they are, they don't want me to have children, any more children. Um, so basically this conservatorship is doing me way more harm than good. Um, I, want, I deserve to have a life. I've worked my whole life. I deserve to have a two to three year break and just, you know, do what I want to do. Um, but I do feel like um, there is a crutch here and I feel like um, I feel open and I'm okay to talk to you today about it. But I, I wish I could stay with you on the phone forever because when I get off the phone with you, all of a sudden, all of I hear, I hear all these no's, no, no, no. And then all of a sudden I get, I feel ganged up on and I feel bullied and I feel left out and alone. And I'm tired of feeling alone. I deserve to have the same rights as anybody does by having a child, a family, any of those things and more so. Um, and that's all I wanted to say to you. And thank you so much for letting me speak to you today. Third, here are some snippets. I've been in denial. I can't sleep. I'm depressed. I'm traumatized. I'm in shock. I'm so angry. It's insane. When rationalizing why everything has happened, she states, I honestly think they are trying to kill me. She also added that she'd previously complained to this court about the abuses, but it fell on deaf ears. Okay, number 10. While Brittany was clearly experiencing barriers to success in her personal life, those barriers were largely external, not internal. They were created by a mob of paparazzi that was constantly stalking her and her family, acquaintances, and managers who only looked at her as a cash cow or an ATM. Brittany is not only a world-renowned pop star, she is a human with social and emotional needs. And she, like anyone else, is likely to have periods of self-doubt, trouble coping, and at times even a depressed mood. She's not a circus animal to be worked tirelessly without, unusual, without usual human care. That is what she and others have reported. Oh man. Number 12, the reported mental breakdown where she made quote, bad judgments like cutting off her hair, driving with her child in her lap or locking herself in a bathroom are pedestrian mental health events and do not require anything approaching the harsh sentence she has received. In addition, it appears that Brittany was experiencing postpartum depression. So he's not saying she was, he's saying it appears that she was. So he's not diagnosing, he's saying, you know, from what it looks like to me, it looks like she was. Having delivered two boys with successive pregnancies. So she was pregnant for like an entire year, basically. Um, sorry, like two entire years, basically. Cause she like had the first child and then within a year she had the second child. Anyone with an ounce of compassion could understand trying to protect a suckling child in the arms of a new mother, which was the case when Brittany was taken from her home on an emergency 5150 hold. Maternal instincts require that she would not want to give up her baby. Um, number 13. In fact, any mental health concerns Brittany had could have easily been managed by a health professional who is invested in putting Brittany on a path to success in both her private and public lives. Further, it could have been managed in the privacy of her home through a telehealth electronic and or mobile platform um, or with home visits from a provider given her resources. 
This would obviate the need to parade her. So this would like get rid of the need to parade her in front of paparazzi for mental health care visits out in the community. She spoke of this embarrassing situation on June 23rd. It is a fact that Brittany has suffered immensely during the 13 and a half years of the conservatorship. The best illustration of this is her own words. I honestly think they were trying to kill me. Hello? Hello? I honestly think they were trying to kill me is a quote. And she's still in this conservatorship with these same abusers in charge of her. Like, how is this still happening? (sighs) During her testimony on June 23rd, her entire speech was cogent and coherent, even to someone not trained in the clinical interview. No diagnosis or declaration of capacity precludes an individual from being taken seriously when they are expressing physical or emotional harm in such a convincing manner. I agree. But it was not the first time she had expressed such to the court. Again, he's reminding the court, she already told y'all this and you still didn't do anything. But it fell on deaf ears to this court and her personal attorney, Sam Ingham. Number 15. Here are the harsh conditions imposed on her during the conservatorship thus far. A. Social isolation. She was cut off from her usual social support connections. Loss of autonomy over her body. She was forced to have treatment and medications she did not want and had loss of her reproductive rights. C. Restriction of movement and freedom. She is guarded 24-7 by security guards who enforce the restrictions on her movements. Out of the house, such as going for a drive with her boyfriend, All this, even though Brittany is not a criminal and she is not a threat, she is a threat to no one. Certainly no one is trying to harm her intentionally. No one is trying to harm her intentionally, although it might be possible for her to be suffocated from all the hugs her fans want to give her due to the abuse she has been going through. Okay. D, inability to benefit from the fruits of her hard labor. Exactly. And this is where the trafficking and human ownership issue comes in. Having others around her benefiting more than her from her work is probably distressful. Her hard work is detailed in paragraph 16, okay? All these conditions are individually damaging to one's psyche and collectively much more so. So if you take all these little things, they're damaging. When you put them all together, it's a really big deal. He's saying it's even worse. Um, The worst thing of all is the way Brittany was gaslighted and forced into treatment with heavy psychotropic medications she did not need. There seems to have been a concerted effort to convince Brittany that she had a serious, irreversible mental condition, such that at the age of 26 years old, the best years of her life were already behind her and there would be limited quality time with her beloved children in the future. These are facts that can easily be inferred when one's own father family, managers, personal lawyer, and even personal doctor are in on the profitable scheme through not only words, but through their heavy actions. They're participating in the scheme. One measure of someone's work ethic is the work product. And for Brittany, her hard work has placed her into the very fabric of the world music scene. On Google, one just needs to type in the first name Brittany to get information about her. Here's a reminder to Dr. Spar, the judges and the judges responsible. Sorry. Here is a reminder to Dr. Spar and the judges responsible for this conservatorship for the past 13 and a half years as to the top accomplishments of their conservatee. And he puts their in italics because he's basically saying y'all are just as guilty judges. Then he has some bullet points. First, her debut album is one of the best selling in history. Her Baby One More Time hit is the best-selling single of all time and has the singular distinction of being the number one hit in every country that charted it. The accompanying video in the author's experience was so impactful that it started a noticeable change in school-aged girls in the way they dressed, in their attitudes, in their confidence levels, and they continue to be influenced by Britney. Her highly successful debut is a product of Britney's appreciation for first impressions and the athletic skill added to musical performance is a testament to her work ethic, even as a child. She didn't just knock it out of the park. She knocked the crap out of it out of the park. The world took notice. Her album Blackout has been added to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and it ironically has created the same... 
And it ironically was created the same year she was undergoing the mental breakdowns, alleged mental breakdowns, that led to the 5150 holds and eventually to the conservatorship. Her music videos have been awarded MTV's highest honors and she's given iconic performances at VMA productions. She has also won a Grammy, the highest achievement in the music industry. She's the youngest artist ever to get a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Really? I don't know if that's true. That true? I think Shirley Temple had one when she was real young. I don't know, maybe. I don't know. Her fragrance line has grossed over 1.5 billion worldwide. She has had a successful comeback despite the constraints of this conservatorship. The Piece of Me show in Las Vegas grossed approximately $138 million over a period of four years, during which time <clears throat> she only went out on the town twice. She is known worldwide as the Princess of Pop and has an Instagram following of over 34 million fans, which is growing every day. There are groups on Instagram. She most likely is the most photo or videographed person in the world. I don't know what this, I don't know what this is. There are groups on Instagram means. Thus, when Britney sings, you better work, B, it comes from a place she knows well, <laughs> literally. Never has it been heard by someone standing in line to see Britney. I can't wait to see what Britney's management has done. Or I spent all this money because Jamie is the greatest person and I want to see what he has helped to create. No. All the fans are there solely to see Britney. Period. She deserves every penny coming to her. Good point, dude. Because I see a lot of times, I, I, and I anticipate once this all goes to litigation, that they're going to all start saying, like, we made Britney who she was. She was nothing until we gave her voice lessons. We gave her dance lessons. We did her costumes. We did her tours. We, they're going to start saying that. And this guy's saying, okay, cute. But when those fans are standing in line, are they saying, oh, can't wait to see Robin Greenhill and Lou Taylor? Hell no. They want to see what Britney Jean Spears is about to do. And that is who is the artist. The personal conservator in Britney's case is not qualified to handle the task and should be removed. <laughs> Britney is vulnerable to misuse by the medical profession due to her fame and wealth and potential need for future mental health services as an occupational hazard, largely because of the external factors that go with the life of a rock star. It is apparent that the personal conservators of Britney have participated in doctor shopping, have only employed those physicians willing to support the enterprise, which Jody Montgomery has benefited from immensely. Hmm, tell them, tell them. The enterprise even brazenly has its own motto. Isolate, medicate, liquidate. A motto that has been seen often on social media. And this is larger guardianship and conservatorship abuses in general. Few people in history have had to deal with the amount of fame that comes along with being a musical icon. Too many of them have checked out of this world well before normal life expectancy. Good point, dude. Few people in history have had to deal with the amount of fame that comes with being a musical icon. So many of them die young. Thus, the position of personal conservator of Britney will require that they have enough medical knowledge to both seek appropriate care when it is needed and to step in and question the care when it is not needed, Jody Montgomery. This is called a, gate, a gatekeeper function, which is usually a general care physician. Case in latter point. The well-documented involuntary admission into a mental health facility when Brittany was charged $60,000 for the month out of her own pocket and the use of first-generation psychotropics like lithium that are rarely used and only in the most severe intractable mental health cases. So he's saying like, look, they did this. This was way outside of necessary and somebody should have been a gatekeeper saying you can't do that. And Jody just didn't do it. But again, Jody would say... She wasn't actually the conservator at that time. And that's going to have to be something that they sort out in court. Number 21. Britney has a loyal fan base of millions of fans who love and adore her both as a person and a performer. Many of them are trustworthy professionals who would never think to exploit her in a way that she has been for the last 13 and a half years. Bludgeoned and defiled by the unethical participants while this court has tied her hands. I don't know what he put that in there for, but he's basically saying like, hey, Britney, like, maybe you can get your doctors from the move. I don't know what this is about, but I do really like this in it. Many of them are more trustworthy. Many of them would never think to exploit Brittany in the way that she has been for the past 13 and a half years. Okay, this part. I like this part. Bludgeoned and defiled 
by unethical participants while this court has tied her hands. Uh, paragraph 22. It has never been established why Brittany needs a probate conservatorship and there is no compelling or legal medical reason to be in one. Period. And this is it. The end. I won't make this a different color because I'm just like, hello. It has never been established why Brittany needs a probate conservatorship. It has never been established. It has never been established why Brittany needs a probate conservatorship. Period. It's Brittany, bitch.